at the top is the most important part, the broad end of the triangle is the home groups, the members. The base of the triangle is so big and so important that it needs the rest of the triangle beneath it to keep that flow going so we can make sure that the next sick and suffering alcoholic gets into these rooms, that the literature is distributed, that resources like the Grapevine podcast and the Grapevine magazine are distributed out there to sort of be that collective voice out there to keep the connection flowing. So we can still carry that message to somebody who's struggling right now that might not have, you know, the awareness of the solution. Like I really didn't. I heard it through the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collective voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I am Alice, an alcoholic in the wild. It, in the <laughs> wild. <laughs> yeah, Alice is at large. Yes, I am. Lock your doors. <laughs> <laughs> I might show up in your home group. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be a pleasure if you were to show. What city are you in right now? I am currently in McLean, Virginia, a bedroom community uh washington dc and i've been hitting great meetings in the washington dc area oh cool what's been happening in in the meetings you know i went to the 79th group anniversary for the cosmopolitan group and although it was not the first african-american meeting i don't know if most people know this but you know, we've got to remember that Alcoholics Anonymous started in 1934. We started having meetings. And mm-hmm. so black people and white people, by law, were not supposed to integrate spaces. And so there were separate black meetings. And the Cosmopolitan meeting was the first black meeting that was listed in the directory. And they had their 79th anniversary. Wow. Um, it was amazing. I really, really am glad that I went to the packed house almost 200 people online on Zoom. And now, of course, because things have changed, a fully integrated group of people. In fact, it's prided itself on being an integrated meeting for many, many decades. Fantastic. Lots of fun. There's good recovery here in the Washington, D.C. area. I know that Miley T. was on the podcast not too long ago. And she talked about Florence, who was given $50 and said, go to Washington, D.C. and start AA. (laughs) (laughs) And she did. She moved and uh, talk about recovery and being willing to go to any lengths. At the First World Conference in St. Louis, the gentleman that joined Bill on stage, uh, Jim, whose story is in the big book, Jim's story was the first black story in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And so he is credited with starting Black AA in Washington, D.C. His story is in the first edition? His story is still in the big book now. Still in the big book. And the fourth edition, it's on page 232. This physician, one of the earliest members of AA's first black group, tells how freedom came as he worked among his people. In the third edition... It's under They Lost Nearly All. Jim's story is on page 483. I love that this is part of that long restructuring that we read in the forward, and people are like, what are you talking about? (laughs) They move the stories around. The first part of the book, the pages aren't changed, and the text isn't changed, but the forwards and the stories in the back change, and they want to move the stories around to... Try and keep them current to the time so that people can identify in yeah. in reading the book. Well, so that's my happenings in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and a little bit of AA history, which is appropriate for today because yeah. we're going to have a blast from the past a little bit later on. But who's our guest today? Today, we have Tracy D., not from Buffalo, New York, but from Buffalo, Love, New York. Buffalo. <laughs> Buffalo. Buffalo. Where, where I secretly long for Buffalo pizza. Does it have Buffalo mozzarella on it? I do, no, it, this is real pizza, Don. <laughs> this is real pizza. 
<laughs> okay. So we'll get to meet Tracy and we're going to have the blast from the past. And today it's going to be Ernest McKay from New York City, a 1951 recording. So it's a good recording. And Ernest McKay is one of the first 100. And he talks about Bill W. visiting him in the hospital. So good stuff. Blast from the past. Sounds explosive. Well, that's what happens when time itself collapses and the past collides with the present. Is that the fourth dimension of existence that we hear so much about? <laughs> yeah, I think that might be it. Here we go. <laughs> Happy birthday, Grapevine. June 1944 to 2024, 80 wonderful years. Help us celebrate. Get your groups and areas involved. Tell everyone about our exciting new app. And subscribe to the app. Send us your story. Hold a Grapevine workshop. Become a Grapevine rep. Get your group or district to hold a Grapevine event. Use Grapevines in your AA meeting. Give your sponsee or a newcomer a Grapevine subscription. Tell people about this podcast. Send us a beautiful photo for our Instagram account. Join our Carry the Message project. Get your group to support Grapevine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you so much, Don and Alice. What an honor and a privilege. I am alcoholic Tracy D from Buffalo, New York. And my sobriety date is November 19th, 2022. My home group is the Thursday Night Women's Literature Group that meets every Thursday at the corner of Nottingham Terrace and Amherst Street in North Buffalo. <laughs> Thank you for that. I love that you gave the location. <laughs> yeah, please come visit. <laughs> Tracy, what was going on with you in 2022 that brought you to AA? What was going on with you inside? In 2022, I hit rock bottom by the grace of God, and I don't want to see that basement. I had enough of the solution that never worked. It was a solution that worked for a while, and it turned against me like that boomerang that cut me all but to ribbons, as it says. Before I made it into AA, I made it into Al-Anon two days after I got sober. I didn't get into the doors of AA until almost three months into sobriety. So I was welcomed into the doors of AA, and it's like a light went off. Hi, I'm Tracy, and I'm an alcoholic, and it was a beautiful experience. You know, I was tired of... Go, waking up in strange places with strange people doing the strange things. And I'm not an alumni of a rehab center, but I'm an alumni of a psych ward. So I was released from a psych ward relapsed immediately upon um, leaving the parking lot. And that's, that's the most mm. sober I'd ever been. I never even had caffeine in those six days that I was there. And I had a 10 day bender. I had a blackout drunk in the bar down the street coming home said, you know what, I don't really think I can do this anymore. And my uh, sobriety date was a couple of days later. So you went to Al-Anon? I am an apple that fell from a tree in a whole orchard of uh, the family <laughs> disease. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I rolled into the doors of Al-Anon because my mom had been asking me throughout my whole life since I was old enough to qualify for Alateen to get into Al-Anon. Yeah, and the, the women were so wonderful and loving because yeah. you, you can't tell an alcoholic they're an alcoholic, but you boy, cannot. they were praying for me. Yeah. <laughs> and Could they tell you that you were an alcoholic? Oh, yeah, I would, say, I would say in the meetings, I take a drink, a drink takes a drink, a drink takes me, and it's too much. But these people, these, you know, I could see it in everybody else, but I, I'm somebody Not that yourself. needs to, yeah, I need somebody to read the pickle jar. Yeah. I can't read my own label. Yeah. Wow. I love that you came in through Al-Anon, but I started in Al-Anon and in AA together. Same thing. I'm an apple from an orchard. And I thought my real problem is my family. Yeah. The delusion of it all. I'm yeah. drunk, but I think it's them. Well, I understand that. But like when I quit drinking, ooh, it, I needed help because I wanted to drink so bad I was going to blow up. 
I didn't go into a treatment center, just started coming to AA meetings. So how did you deal with the internal combustion that says, <laughs> yeah, I've got to drink in those first, did you say three months? Three months, which is the magic time frame that whenever I tried to do it on my own, I would go back out around, you know, I'd pick up again around that three month mark because it wasn't the first time I tried to get sober. It's just the first time that I was willing to rely on a power greater than myself. So you had no problem with wanting to drink again. So I, I was so delusional. I couldn't remember the first few months until it was like hindsight is 2020. I was still going to parties, like putting juice into shot glasses with my friends and going, it's fine. I'm sober. I'm cool. And I would try to have some of that, you know, stealing that vicarious pleasure yeah. mm -hmm. before I actually got a hold of a big book. And I was holding on, white knuckling it, going to Al-Anon, completely delusional, stark raving sober, mm -hmm. absolutely ragingly abstinent. And it was, it was tough. It was tough. I would try to steal a lot of that vicarious pleasure until I had a close encounter of the almost not sober kind with a friend who had a birthday at a bar. I, by the grace of God, did not pick up that night. I just instead shoveled as much ice cream into my face as possible, had intense breakdown, had horrible relapse dreams. And I said, I, I, I can't do this. I yeah. got to get my feet into AA. Yeah. Oh. So what was different in AA that helped you to stay sober? Honestly, everything. You got to change one thing, everything. And that's what um, you guys have told me. I got to change everything. I have to be willing to listen. I have to be willing to understand that I, I don't have all of the answers. I have to be willing to be told what to do and to do it. And, uh, and it's just suggestions, right? I have to be willing to take the suggestions. I have to be willing to write down all of the resentments that I had, which, you know, it's a lifelong monologue <laughs> by that <laughs> point. And I had to be willing to tell somebody and I had to be willing to forgive and forgiveness. That was something that I begged for myself, but I didn't want to forgive people. The difference was honestly just being in this program, doing as I was told, even though I'm super defiant, <laughs> honestly going through the steps, speaking honestly with my sponsor, understanding that not telling my sponsor something is still lying by omission. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I also want to hold up the police department, right? Their resource officer and Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, a part of the work that we do is we reach out to the professionals. We reach out to the community around us to make sure that they understand who we are and what we do so that they can do exactly what happened for you, which is to understand Alcoholics Anonymous and to say, hey, how about you look into turning your passion into a certificate? To say a little more about how that worked and what that experience was having someone from the police department engage you that way. It was really beautiful. I was hanging up these flyers that have local resources for uh, mental health advocacy and the suicide prevention um, hotline that's local and national. And I was hanging it up and he just happened to pull up next to me in the squad car He's like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, this is the advocacy that I told you about. And he's like, wow, that's great. Have you ever looked into, it's called SERPA for short, the SERPA, you know, certification, and you can really actually be employed <laughs> for doing this. I'm like, oh, I was just doing, it was a power greater than myself. You know, I just knew that somebody out there needed to feel that they were loved. Even if I didn't see them, it's just about doing the work and just about understanding that my higher power is going to carry this message, whether I see it or not. Yeah, he recommended it to me. Then I talked to my mental health care providers. They ended up linking me to the facility and they carried regular AA meetings. And yeah, I made it into that AA meeting and it was it was wonderful. And occasionally I actually give this particular behavioral specialist a call and give him an update. It's been a very beautiful journey. I got into AA and I still had that delusion. Of, like I must not be a real alcoholic. And this is like singleness of purpose is so huge. You know, tradition five. I heard somebody say I'm an alcoholic and a crackhead. And I was just like, nope, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't smoke crack. <laughs> Tradition five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And you referred to that as our singleness of purpose. Yes, and it's huge because 
we are alcoholics. This is alcoholism. There are different fellowships for different reasons. And sure, things could be co-occurring. But I was somebody, you know, identify and don't compare. And I was comparing myself. Yeah. I was trying to compare myself right out of the rooms, right out of the rooms, yep. right out of the rooms because, of course, I got into Al-Anon first. I could, you know, spot it. You got it. And I hated that. I hated that slogan. Yeah. Now I love it because now it's like, look at that person. Look at me. Oh, look at you. Look at me. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, yeah, I was sitting there and comparing and going, nope, I don't do that or I've never done that or I never had this happen to me or I'm so terminally unique nobody's as traumatized as I am newsflash everybody is so yeah (laughs) you spot it you got it I love that saying because something that you really don't like in somebody usually is an indication that you have that same characteristic or quality it really helped change the course of my recovery because as opposed to just looking at something that annoyed me and focusing on the other person it helped me turn the attention to me, which is where recovery is, right? And think like, am I that way? Do I do that? Am I annoyed because I do that? Mm-hmm. If somebody throws salt on you, it only burns in places where you're sore. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh. So Tracy, what is going on with you today in your recovery? Oh gosh, um, a sense of self-worth and self-love that I've never experienced that I've always like hunted after and just peace and ease and a sense of purpose because I am the GSR of my home group. That's the general service representative. At the district level, I'm the secretary. I am involved at the intergroup level. I'm part of volunteering for Night Watch as well, where that's our after hours call line. It's crazy, all of the beautiful things that AA is given. I'm traveling now. I've been to Canada a couple times and able to take my daughter there. I've been to Hershey, PA at my first Northeast Regional AA Service Assembly, NARASA, and I first heard about AA Service Assemblies on this very podcast, hearing about PRASA, the Pacific Regional AA Service Assembly, and yeah, I've got a network now. I've got like hundreds of people in my phone where beforehand it was, gosh, it was like the five using friends and like a bunch of (laughs) the party providers. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You said that you have a daughter. I do. (laughs) So how do you juggle getting sober and having a family? So I do share her with my ex-spouse. He's been the one in my corner since even before I got sober to say, you got to do this for you. And that's also what's changed is this time around, I'm doing it for me. We're best friends. He's my absolute best friend. And honestly, that is a huge blessing. And I am grateful that today my higher power had put me in a position to sort of be that break in the generational cycle just by leaning on those supports because You know, my family members didn't have the tools and the privilege like I do now. Yeah, she's my little Alatot and I take her around and she's her own little rock star. And she's she's really grateful. She actually said, um, and I'll never forget this. I she said, Mom, I'm so happy that you're sober now in an AA because she's seen it. She's seen a lot of what I was like and what I was doing. And she's she's ultimately very you know, she's seeing me and she even said, mom, I hope I'm an alcoholic just like you one day. Oh, no. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for, babe. But you know what? That's in God's hands, not mine. <laughs> but it's because she's seen the benefits of the program working through me. And of course, my first reaction was like, oh, no, but it was like, you know what? It really isn't up to me. And at least she's being shown that there's a solution and it's not for people who necessarily want it or need it. It's for people that do it. It is a program of action. Absolutely. And AA has given me my life. And for that, I am truly grateful. Tracy, thank you so much for shining the light on the gift of Alcoholics Anonymous that you've been given the relationship with your child, the relationship with your partner. Like so many of us come to Alcoholics Anonymous and think it's impossible. And here you are shine in the light that it is indeed possible. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Blast from the past. The next voice is that of Ernest Mc... recorded at the Tudor Group, April the 6th, 1952.
And uh, getting sober, you know, when you have a pattern in your life for many, many years of uh, drinking, to make a change oftentimes is a gradual thing. That is one of the basic concepts of AA, that we live for 24 hours a day. I said one night in a meeting, as a matter of fact, I said you have to stay sober even if life stinks. And uh, a woman came up to me after the meeting and she said to me, uh, Ernest, I thought your talk was very good, but that point about life uh, stinky. Uh, I think life in sobriety can be stimulating. And I said, well, I'm thoroughly aware of the fact that life in sobriety is stimulating. But I know that there are certain times when that poor devil sitting out there is in a period of depression, and even everything could be all right, but you couldn't get to him. And it's at that time when many alcoholics, not for any particular reason other than ordinary boredom, and a feeling of general futility and a general lack in their own life that they want to go over into that dream world and live in that realm of fantasy and take, as Muriel said, that powder and relapse and seek oblivion from life. Now, Bill Williams came to see me. I had known him prior to AA. And he came to see me in Towns in 1935. I was in Towns 55 times. Just a few trips. He came to see me in 1935, and he said, Now, we have this situation, and so forth and so on. He brought a guy with him with a black Homburg hat on. And I thought he was a promoter. Been in Wall Street all my life, and I'd known many promoters, and... Uh, but I was very low, you know, and when you're low, you'll agree to anything. So I thought to myself, well, I'll just listen and see what they have to say. It's probably something to sell. But I'm down now, but I'll get out. I'll sober up. When I get out, I'll tell them to go to hell. I'll agree. So, all right, and this guy could tell me just threw this problem to the man over his shoulder. Just passed it over. I was in a fog. I didn't know what he meant. Finally, Bill Wilson talked to me, and I said to Bill, now listen. I said, uh, my wife just divorced me for drinking. I still have some money. Now I'm going to start drinking in peace. I've absolutely no desire to quit drinking. I will periodically put myself in towns and sober up and uh, go back to work. So I took the hard road. It wasn't until 1940 that I had to agree. I came in many times. I was invited to meetings and this and that and so forth and so on and sort of warm my hands at the fire looked on, it quite didn't mean anything to me, but along in 40 I came to the conclusion that no matter what these people have, whether it's a form of self-hypnosis or whatever it is, they're staying sober and I'm continuing to drink and continuing to slip. You'll never get anything out of AA in a thousand years unless you yourself are willing to contribute of yourself. You can stand on the sidelines, you can listen to a thousand people speak, but unless you learn the program on a basis of contributing of yourself, you really will never get it. We alcoholics are all introverts. We're tremendous students of the other guy. We look at somebody and say, well, I don't know. <laughs> Looks sort of phony to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's an angle there, see? And 
and you might be almost right. We're quite sensitive. We're quite perceptive. We're keen that way because we've always sort of lived in a way by our wits. We've been manipulators. We've been shrewd handlers. We've had to be to get ourselves out of the spots that we've found ourselves in. AA gives you a new understanding of sincerity, a new understanding of the power that is greater than yourself. I used to say, uh, for instance, when they talk about they talk about the spiritual power and they talk about God, and I'd say, well, I'll just proceed on this thing from a psychological standpoint, because I have never gotten any messages, I have never had any revelations, and when they start to talk about the miracle in my life or the miracle in their lives. I don't know what it is. And it used to annoy me when I heard people talk about spiritual experiences. Because why? Because I was always projecting myself. I used to think if Wilson had this spiritual experience, how the hell did it happen that it passed me up? (laughs) Who the hell is he? to have a spiritual experience and I'm going along on a half a leg. (laughs) What I wanted was a magic wand waved over by AA. You're sober now, boy, and you're wonderful. It doesn't work that way. You've got to get down to a new understanding of values in your own life. You have to start to learn to enjoy and to live with the small things, the things that you cast up, and those things express themselves and they become a part and a parcel of what is known as the spiritual experience, which is a form of living a philosophy of approach to life. If you do nothing more than lead a sober life, you add yourself up under AA to better principles of living. And you express spirituality, whether you're a church attendant or not. And I've been sober now a matter of quite a number of years. And I do know that when I have found that going hard, and I have called on the power greater than myself for help, that I might not of necessity help myself, but that I might be of help to others, and that I might be able to help some poor devil who had had the same experience that I have had, and that I might never lose my perspective of the time that I was down and out, and that I might maintain the common touch and have within me the real expression of what AA means in its entirety when they say he is a free man whom the truth makes free and all our slaves beside. I thank you. Thanks to everyone who subscribes to The Grapevine magazine in print or in the AA Grapevine app. Your support makes this podcast possible. I'm at the very wit's end. This wit's end is from Alan W. in Greensboro, North Carolina. All right. God, so far today I've been good. I have not been too selfish. I haven't lied to anyone. I haven't harmed anyone I can think of, and I've not wanted to drink. But God, I'm about to get out of this bed, and I'm going to need your help. (laughs) (laughs) It's really not that funny.
Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Search AA Grapevine in the App Store on your phone or find AA Grapevine on Instagram and YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, search online for Alcoholics Anonymous in your city or visit aa.org. That was freaking amazing. <laughs> 